Welcome to Above the JPEG. What's going on, everyone? This is the place where you can find the latest NFT trend and the most relied NFT content. So, this week we have Evan Chen on our podcast. Evan is a Techstar mentor as well as a investor in Web3. Evan, fresh out of college, actually, not long after he was out of college, he started his own fund starting to invest in startups. So I'm excited to hear what Evan has to say about Web3 and how he invests in Web3 and what people should watch out for in the Web3. If you're interested too, stay and tune in. Evan, Evan Chen, welcome to the show, man. Welcome to Above the JPEG, brother. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. I'm doing well. How are you? Good, 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 man. So Evan, last time we chatted, I was honestly, I was quite, quite surprised, right? So we somehow got connected on Twitter and I was asking a whole bunch of questions about token race. And it seems like you understood a lot about this. So we got on a call and I learned just so much from you. Um, and, and, you know, I thought, Hey, maybe I got to get Evan on the show, you know, one day soon. So <laughs> I'm glad it's happening today. So Evan, for those who haven't heard of your name, give us an intro on yourself, man. Tell us what you did, you know, what's your background, you know, what are you excited about and all that stuff? Sure. Uh, I went to the University of Michigan and studied finance and CS, uh, came out of college, worked in big tech for two years uh, in a finance function, and then afterwards worked at a startup in an engineering function. Um, and then after that, decided to st- uh, quit that to start my own thing, um, which is run my own fund. Um, and kind of leading up to this, a lot of this outside of work was working with startups, uh, uh, working with a lot of different uh, VC funds, uh, a few different accelerators. And so kind of through this kind of venture side of things I did outside of work, a lot of it came to a head, particularly Web3. And so uh, also kind of got involved in Web3, started in 2017. Um, I guess more so crypto, I'd say, because I was a trader back then. And then by 2020, 2021, kind of tail end of DeFi summer into NFT summer, really got into the more investing side in terms of investing in specific companies. Um, and through that, just kind of really wanted to start a fund investment DAO specifically um, and invest in web three companies. Yeah, we're sort of focusing on most now. Dude, so wait, Evan, you look so young. So how old are you if you don't mind revealing? <laughs> I'm 24. Dude, so you're 24 and you started your own fund. Right out uh, of college. Yeah, um, a little bit out of college, yes. Uh, so like about three years out of college. Um, yeah, so definitely, you know, had to work a lot for it, but really thankful for a lot of the friends and mentors and people around me who helped me along the way and definitely couldn't have done it without them. I mean, a lot of this Dude. is a very interesting space as you can imagine, right? VC, just getting in is a really tough. And, so and, and it's VC fund. Really That's right. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of a, it's, it's a VC fund in the sense that we're investing in startups, but structurally speaking, it's kind of a cross between a syndicate and a VC fund. So gotcha. traditionally like a, a syndicate, like, you know, you have people participate and then whoever wants to deploy however much capital, you put that in. Um, and then if it doesn't fill around, does fill around, whatever it might be, that's one version. And then a venture fund is like one person make a decision and they write the entire check. And the middle of the two is that uh, you have a lot of people who have money contributing to one singular fund. Everyone participates in terms of decision making. But as long as there's a consensus in the majority that there's an investment to be made, um, the entire allocation will be filled rather than just a small percent of whoever wanted to actually fill that round. Dude, that's amazing, man. I mean, you know, it's still like age of 24, right? So I'm 21. <laughs> and, and you know, I, I actually looked into starting a fund, but, uh, you know, uh, I, I haven't I haven't sat on it. So, dude, I mean, that, that, I mean, I did my research and it's uh, it's actually quite a lot of work, man. Um, so leading that off, the Whisper DAO, is that what you currently most concentrating your focus on? What are you what are you currently right. f- yeah. focusing on right now, Evan? Yeah, so Whisper DAO um, and just kind of doing a lot of research within the Web3 space. So even in the bear market, there's a lot of stuff to be done. Uh, so that's kind of the fun part, just identifying different companies, identifying different thesis points as to what should and or could be done uh, over the next several cycles and years. And so uh, just exciting to continue learning, building, meeting more people, helping them also. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us about, tell us a little, tell us about the whisper down, man. Is it so, so what is your focus now? You're starting off as a crypto trader right back in 2017. I actually, I actually started off um, from like a similar 
similar point, except I didn't trade. I just nice. saw Bitcoin. I just thought I thought it was sketchy, but I still wanted it. And then I didn't end up getting the Bitcoin. I got I got the Litecoin oh, back in 2017. Um, but then that that really led me to the NFT stuff that I was doing. Um, but I know you started with uh, trading. You had a finance finance background. Um, how mm -hmm. did and then what what route did you, did it took? Because I asked you a whole bunch of token related questions, and those are pretty DAO centric, right? But what mm -hmm. is your route, man? Like you went from finance, and then I, I mean you went from trading. How did you arrive to this point where you're working on DAO? Yeah, so um, the trading route was kind of definitely also the way I got in. So I started with just like individual token trading at the very beginning. Um, and then kind of definitely fell off like a lot of other people when the you know bear market came in between 2017 and kind of 2020. Um, and by 2020, it was like, oh shit, now there's a lot more volatility, there's a lot more activity. Um, I think as a trader myself, like when you see volatility, you see that there's price deficiencies. And um, in that case, you just are able to capture a lot more value. And that's kind of what brought me back into it again as a trader. Uh, but then getting to the NFT space was probably the biggest one where I started talking to a lot more people, right? Uh, meeting a lot of just community members, founders, people who are just generally traders, maybe degenerate or otherwise. Um, and then from there, kind of expanded my network a lot more into the Web3 space. And then that's kind of how I got more involved in DAOs. Um, less so about the trading side, but more so about like, hey, this is actually, aside from the money to be made, aside from the JPEGs, like... Um, there's actually some structural things that are really interesting happening here. There's a lot of things in the tech stack as well that could be really interesting to continue helping support. And so with that, started talking to a lot more DAOs, uh, you know, joined a few that were, you know, more open. And then over time started actually contributing to some DAOs. Um, one of the first of which was actually writing a white paper for a DAO. Um, and I think a lot of this comes down to how you, you know, market yourself, but also a lot of these doubts are like, hey, like we're a small team. We have a lot of stuff to do. Um, you guys are, you know, very passionate community members. Here's a list of all the things that we would love to have somebody contribute to in some capacity. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they're, they're going to take everything that they're given, right? They can probably like, you know, filter through it, all that stuff. But at the end of the day for them, it's like, hey, this is a value add community member who's doing it for free essentially, but because they just believe in this overall mission. That's kind of how I first got into it. I just like started contributing to a few DAOs. Early on, I was like, what is going on? Like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I know I have some skills, but I don't know how good they are relative to everybody else's and how much I actually want it. But to, in my mind, I was like, look, it's free. Um, if it's shit, then they'll just throw it away and fine. I'll just have a little bit of experience. If it's great, even better, they'll take it, they'll implement it. If it's amazing, they'll not only take it, but then they'll want to hire me, right? So the, the upside is very limited. Um, and the downside, obviously, is just the time you spent in. But I think part of it is also learning, right? You're just kind of iterating, but then with some purpose. Um, that's kind of how I really dove into the DAO space. Yeah. Dude, so tell us about Whisper DAO, man. Yeah. Um, so the reason it's called the Whisper DAO is the context is whispers. Um, so think about it like there are many different industries right out there. So a lot of them are very siloed, very much so like if you want to change industries, it's pretty difficult because the idea here is there's a lot of quote unquote whispers that you really need to understand and have in order to basically break into it, be able to talk to the right people, say the right things in interviews, and then actually get that job, right? But also is it like, it doesn't necessarily have to be even a career there. It could be like angel investing, for example, right? Like what is a cap table? What are term sheets? Like those are all still things that even though you're doing it on the side, like there's a lot of, I guess, quote unquote whispers in the industry that you don't really get to hear about unless if you actually get exposed to it and taught it. And so the idea is twofold. Number one, um, the people who are being brought into this organization right now are people from a wide variety of backgrounds, primarily, you know, Web3 or Web2, Web3 like founders and VCs, a lot of Web2 founders and VCs as well. And these are people who are also people like operators in big tech um, and otherwise, but people who have a very diverse range of experiences who have a very similar mindset of like, hey, we believe in investing, particularly in Web3, and we might not have the specific skill set for that, but we have tangential skill sets that can all be combined as an organization to help founders in specific ways, right? So like in these examples, like, hey, maybe I like run a sales team on like some series B startup. Well, guess what? You have great sales experiences and any founder really in any space needs selling skills, right? So like there's always different components you can pull in as, as a whole. Um, and then the goal here is for everyone to share ideas and actually help each other kind of learn about everybody else's whispers and kind of grow the collective brain. So like the idea then bigger picture is with the bigger brain and more kind of diverse thought, you have better decision, decision making, better investments and overall, you know, better financial returns. And that's just the first half of the kind of general context. So that's the investing side. And then the, there's an education side where 
in order to facilitate the kind of whispers being passed around. Um, I'm starting it off myself, but basically creating a lot of educational content, uh, primarily focused on investing and like how you think mm -hmm. about founders, how you think about companies, um, and then also about Web3 generally, like how do you think about you know the tech stack? How do you think about application layer, consensus layer, um, all these different chains, protocols, right? Kind of understanding that ecosystem. And so now that they have those contexts, um, these people who might have a similar background or a tangential background can then say, oh, wait, that actually makes a lot of sense. And then from there, make an even better uh, decision. Um, and then overall, kind of everyone starts learning from each other and going. So would you way. say, so Evan, would, would you say that um, um, the Whisper DAO is kind of like a incubator, but instead of only facing towards the founders, it also does, it also serve the investors. So those um, two group gets what do you to mean come by here. Serve, I guess um, they get to suck suck some knowledge, right? They get to learn stuff. They get yes. to right. They get to get some seek. They get to get some good resources that are filtered through uh, because they join this community. So it's kind of like an incubator for both um, the entrepreneurs and uh, and the investors, but uh, it's also descent uh, not decentralized. But how would you how would you put it? So how do you, how do you guys? run the, the DAO man how, did, how are you running the whisper DAO right now you know who makes the decisions yeah. as well as like how do you control people who contribute stuff yeah so frankly speaking like it's not quite decentralized or autonomous quite yet i think uh short term it, it really as i'm trying to build this out and the early days it's pretty much difficult to just give responsibility to everybody because there's two two components here right number one it's like you have to figure out structurally what works what doesn't over time and number two you have to ensure that the community members who you will be giving this control over to later will actually want to continue participating for the long term yep. um so in the meantime it is pretty centralized right now i mean i'm running most of it um but longer term what it's going to look like is there's going to be a sub dao of a bunch of people in venture which provides a lot of deal flow who like will look through a lot of well, not only look through, but also bring the deal flow to the organization. That small sub DAO will be, you know, kind of like thinking about it like an investment team, uh, or like a team that makes a decision on whether or not to make an investment um, on a traditional venture fund. And then once they come to a consensus as to yes, I want to, we want, we like think this is a great opportunity, they will then create a write up, kind of like a proposal for the DAO, and then send that to the DAO, and then everyone can participate and vote based on their, you know, proportional share of how much they've contributed to the overall fund size, um, and then. Once the votes are aggregated, if the vote passes, then great that that amount to be deployed will be deployed. Otherwise, you can come back and have, kind of have further discussions. Dude, that's nice, man. So Evan, every time I talk to you, I want to talk about, I want to compare, right? So I want to talk about a difficult, <laughs> not just the benefit, but also the difficulty. Um, and you always outline them really well. Because last time I asked you about the tokens, you outlined the difficulties in uh, having tokens and its incentive very, very well. Um, in, in this case, man, I was just thinking as you were talking, comparing to a traditional VC fund where you hire people to do the diligence and that sort of stuff for you, do you, do you really think that um, a, a DAO structure, a structure, an investment fund that's structured as a DAO would perform better in terms of uh, you know sourcing deals, in terms of the efficiency? Uh, because, because, okay, let me give you an example, right? So uh, we're a Polygon partner at 10 Exit, and uh, we got a Polygon grant. And the, the way we got that grant was so easy. <laughs> <laughs> what happened was uh, I applied, and uh, they gave me a call a week later. And they say, I, I applied for this amount of money. And then they say, okay, I'm going to give you this amount of money. Is that okay? I was like, yeah, of course that's okay. And then he said, okay, what do you do? I said, well, 10 eggs, you have ABCDFG. And he said, okay, got it. Let me get back to you. Send me your wallet address. And then I send the wallet address. It's done. And um, a couple of days ago, I, I actually texted Polygon Studio again. And it, they're reorganizing everything. So I wasn't sure what happened there. I think I think they might have given away the money too fast and to enrich the, <laughs> enrich the ecosystem too fast. I don't know. So, you know, those are the things where I'm thinking like, hey, Evan, do you think it's going to it's going, it's going to be more efficient or do you think it's going to to be harder since now giving up money is so easy you're just calling your buddy and vote yeah so that's kind of the partially the reason why it's a little more centralized right now i think it really is important for everyone to understand the ability to i guess 
ensure that the decisions being made are the right ones rather than just like oh any deal that seems generally above 50 percent sounds okay right so as of right now uh, i'm doing primarily most of the sourcing um which is kind of the this you know the short-term version of this doing all the diligence and then once i get to a point where i want to make an investment myself then i bring it to the community um and so i think longer term it does make a lot of sense to be a dao mostly because um to your point earlier like deal flow is gonna be really big here like with really, really with any venture fund, uh, I mean, the statistic here is like there's about what 10,000 or so startups every single year, say some portion of that is Web3, say some portion of that is going to be successful. How can you ensure that the slice of companies that you're going to be seeing during that year will be within the small subset that will, you know, be unicorns, billionaires, what a billion, you know, or more. Um, and so in this case, it's like the, the value is to have a very diverse group of people coming from different backgrounds, coming with like different kinds of deals, right? Because if you have everyone in like just B2B SaaS, it's like, well, guess what? All the deals you're going to get are identical. Um, so you have to have a lot of very wide ranging and kind of very kind of interesting different perspectives as well to get that deal flow. Um, and so the value of a DAO is that maybe myself personally, I can get some deal flow here, but well, I can't be everywhere, right? And yep. so having a lot of people come together and do that will be valuable. But then part of it also then says, well, now that we have a kind of small group of people who are really skilled in getting this good deal flow, that also means that they're likely very good at diligence as well. And so you can kind of diligence together and kind of bring those minds together to then say, hey, is this a good or not decision, investment decision to make? Dude, uh, I think that's a so very- That's the very, steady state that's better. Yeah, That's a very valid point, man. Um, you know, before I interviewed- um, this girl, her name is Casey. Uh, go by Casey D on Twitter. She's a NFT artist as well as an NFT entrepreneur, right? At first, I was just nice. like, "Hey, this is the perspective is so important, right?" You mentioned that uh, um, there are certain deals that you understand, and certain deals that you just don't understand, right? Certain deals you just don't get, even um, especially when people first came into Web three. And I think that perspective is really important. Because I interviewed her and I was like, wow, there are so much things that I just didn't see coming from a traditional entrepreneur background versus a technology lover who also creates art, who's also an entrepreneur, right? Um, so you're serving a totally different group of people with a totally different mindset and needs. And dude, I 100% I agree that it will probably it will probably perform a lot better than a traditional VC on the... Um, if there's a when we when we get to a higher scale, right? When we get to a larger scale, when we are looking into different different sections of uh, of business. So, Emma, I know you are a mentor at many many places, and uh, you mentor a lot of projects. Um, I you you also you're also a mentor at text tech, TechStar, right? That's right. Yeah, do I love TechStar, man? They're so cool. Um, yeah. some people what I think they're cooler than YC, honestly, is they have such a large <laughs> network. But um. Yeah. Dude, so tell me about it, man. What are some Web3 projects that you have been mentoring lately? And, uh, you know, and then I'll ask you, like, what worked and what didn't work and that sort of question, probably. But, dude, honestly, I'm interested, man, because you probably int- uh, you're probably mentoring some really interesting projects today. Yeah, so I've been part of three different uh, accelerator cohorts. So for Techstars, for those who are not familiar, it's uh, kind of either localized by city or geography or localized by some company that might want to sponsor an accelerator, or it could be vertical, uh, like a vertical that's like a very specific cohort of, of companies. So I've worked with, uh, there's a sports tech one out in Melbourne, Australia that I worked with. Um, there's a Web3 specific one out in Dublin that I worked with. And I'm currently working with uh, one that's Techstars Anywhere. Uh, which is basically for founders and people who are, you know, anywhere around the world. It's an online uh, program, right? That's right. Yeah. I think that there's a lot of people actually on the team that's in San Diego. So it's a little oh, US centric kind of, but I mean, there are people that are everywhere. So it's really nice to kind of meet people from all over the world. I think that's the biggest value. Definitely. Um, yeah. I mean, there's just so many different projects out there. There, there. there are obviously a lot of Web2 companies in there, which are not necessarily going to think about Web3 at all, because it just doesn't make sense for them. There are some that are like kind of, they can see the gap that they can say, hey, like, actually, I can see how this bridges over to Web3. So they've been kind of, you know, Web 2.5, considering different business strategies. I've been working with them with that. Um, there's one company in particular that I really like that I met recently that was in the Techstars Anywhere cohort. Um, I, I don't know if I can say too much, actually. Uh, okay. But the idea here is um, they are a fintech platform primarily focused on Web2 right now. Um, and they are considering a kind of really interesting way that they can create a decentralized stablecoin. Um, and it's not like an algo stable. It's not like going to be collateralized by some centralized entity. Um, 
essentially what I will say is it's basically collateralized by actual hard fiat. Uh, but the fiat sits in stores and basically any like small local businesses around the world. Um, basically, that would oh, be the wow. collateral behind this. Yeah. Interesting. Um, a decentralized tech stack built for it. A decentralized stable coin that literally has its literally has its backup decentralized in, in different stores cash inventory. Think about a cash register, right? Like, there's no way that they're going to have like just a handful of dollars. Like, let's say any standard cash register, they might have say $500 in there. Well, uh-huh. if you are offering some of that $500 to be backed as this collateral for the stable coin, well, maybe you can earn some yield off of it and say, hey, I'm like a oh, quote unquote validator of these stable coins. But then they don't have to even be that much, right? It could literally be like just $500 for these local businesses is not quite that much money. And there are hundreds, if not millions of uh, of these stores just in the US, but also worldwide, right? And so literally anybody can be this backing of this stable coin. Um, and my perspective here is also actually a small nuance here, right? It's like, um, I haven't said this too much yet. I'm actually writing an article about this. So maybe you'll see it sometime, uh, maybe before or after this episode comes out. Yeah, I haven't out, but, seen much yet, uh, but I'm excited. Uh, yeah, I haven't put it out yet, but the, the context here that I'm thinking a lot about in terms of stable coins, uh, uh, this company aside is that stable coins are very similar to like, really any currency that you have to think about, right? So the example I like to give is the US dollar, which is you know most familiar with um, most people obviously in the US. So we started off when we first seceded from uh, from Britain back in you know 1776, we couldn't just continue using the British like dollar, right? We had to come off of our own currency. And so the context here is we you know created the US treasury, the mint, uh, we created the dollar and that was backed by gold. In this case, right now what the comparison is we have stable coins backed by USD, right? But after a certain point, when the U.S. economy became strong enough to say, hey, our dollars are actually worth a dollar and we have the strength to back that up, they took it off the gold standard. So the same thing had happened in crypto too. People are saying, well, how is stable coins being based off of the U.S. dollars going to ever be sustainable long term if you can still base it off of a sovereign dollar? Well, guess what? The problem here is that Web3 doesn't have enough strength and reliability to say, hey, like these dollars are worth something. Therefore, stable coin has to be based off of something of value. Once we get to Web3 to a point where it doesn't need that backing, then we'll see that being bounced off of the dollar. And I doing see. Whatever it's on its own, right? So because back then, before the dollar was gold, right? Gold had some intrinsic value that people would pay for. Therefore, the US had to say, hey, we're backing our dollar with gold. Once the dollar was not worth something, we don't need gold anymore. So same context, US, uh, USDC, for example, backed by USD. Once we don't need the USD anymore, then we'll just do it on our own, right? Gotcha, dude. That's a, yeah. that's a way, that's a very, very ambitious go. I mean... Uh... That's a very ambitious go, man. I think, I think I'm lack of uh, financial literacy to, to to be able to talk too much about it. But uh, dude, that's a very ambitious go. Um, I actually I actually did a lot of research on the ownership assets transferring from Britain to you. Uh, the the ownership the ownership system from UK to to United States and all that stuff. But I didn't really put a lot of time into studying the currency. Um, but that does make a lot of sense to me hearing that except there's so many stable coins that's going to be on the internet do you think they're all going to have a do you think they're going to be they're going to be valued differently right even after after they move off the uh, usd standard where do you see that uh, that different coin fits into the the internet ecosystem how do like what are we going to use what are people going to use if that ever happens which is we're off the USD standard. Yeah, I mean, it's it's weird to think about, but it's the same thing as when the US took themselves off the, the gold standard, right? They're still based off of an index off of other currencies, right? There's, that's why there's this whole entire foreign exchange ecosystem, right? I don't imagine there to be just one stable coin, similar to how there's not just one sovereign dollar, right? There's the, the, the sterling, there's the euro, there's the yen, there's all, there's all so many other currencies that you can then peg, like do a benchmark against. And it's not to say that it's like individually, it's easy to say this is therefore some value, but it's saying that relative to everybody else, this is how much I'm worth. And so this context kind of pulls a lot from um, the concept of how each chain is kind of an own, its own sovereign entity, right? And by that, it's like they have their own governance rules, they have their own ecosystem of participants, they have their own methods of business. So like they're generating revenue. So do you think about that as GDP, for example? Um, and with that, then they also have some currency in order to be used on 
that chain, or in this case, in this sovereign entity, right? Um, so in a similar case, where if they have their own stablecoin native to that chain, and that chains, well, it doesn't have to be stablecoin, it could just be some asset that can then be correlated against some other um, asset on another chain. Um, and I'm not to say that each chain needs its own stablecoin or every chain needs one stablecoin, but it could, you know, obviously just like, you know, bridging all that stuff too. So there's going to be some some nuance here, but uh, yep. generally speaking, I think they could just index have to Yeah. And it'll be, and it's interesting because right now we're just projecting towards the future, but when the future really comes here, we're going to be able to see, oh, how exactly everything's going to fit in its place, right? That's very interesting, sure. man. Well, dude, hey, towards the end of the show, I'm I'm going to fire some quick fire questions, man. And these questions sure. I ask every guest um, just to provide some great insight on how people learn and how people, what people have learned in the Web3. So first question, brother, what is your biggest crypto Web3 blockchain learning resource? Learning resource, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, or learning source. A lot of different blogs I, I read uh, off. I mean, like the Future, why A16G is great. Paradigm constantly puts a lot of great stuff out. Um, uh, what's it called? Um, sure, I just had it and I just lost it. Uh, I usually don't listen to many podcasts. I was just going to say, mention podcasts, but I, I don't listen to many podcasts. Um, I mean, Twitter obviously is going to be a great source, generally speaking. Um, there's one other site that I constantly look at. Oh, Masari, there we go. Uh, Masari, just fantastic reports, uh, both their research, their intel. Like, there's so many different like components that they like do deep dives on. Um, so those are probably the three primary sources that I like look through constantly. Um, and then other than that, just like a lot of Twitter, there's a lot of people out there who are you know incredibly intelligent, posting you know crazy Twitter threads that no one's really noticing, and that's kind of the source of alpha, I suppose. Um, but then also a lot of like natural thought of your own, right? Like say, hey, like based on these things that I've learned before, um, what new things can I come up with, and then go out and look for that. Um, if it doesn't exist, okay, think about why it doesn't exist, right? Like, is it because people hasn't haven't thought about it, but it actually makes a lot of sense, or is it because it's a dumb idea? And either way, it doesn't matter, right? It's just still a learning process, and um, all to say there's just so much that is going to be built that we have no idea what the future is going to look like yet. So it's just fun right. just to see what else is out there. Yeah, that's right. We're just trying to grab the latest information as much as we can right. and see where, where the train, what the choo-choo rides us to. Right. And what is right. one thing that you learned from working in Dow web three blockchain that you wish that you knew when you first started? Um, <laughs> uh, most organizations, it shouldn't be DAOs uh, because it's a lot easier said than done, right? Like, oh, that's awkward. Yeah, no, objectively, <laughs> it's true, though. Um, being decentralized, okay, I can kind of see it. Being autonomous is the hardest part, right? Because how can you continue to align incentives in the right way, particularly for a complex ecosystem, right? Let's say if it's DeFi protocol, maybe it's just like a simple like DEX. Okay, I can generally see how that can be DAO, decentralized, autonomous, right? But then once you get more complex, start building a product, start building like an entire community with some mission forward, it becomes much more difficult to try and actually coordinate everything and find a way to just do it. You're like on -chain basically then... building a government. Right, exactly. Um, and in that sense, it's saying that you're building a government that everyone who's being governed is part of the government. Um, and it can make sense, right? There's definitely a lot of use cases out there. Um, and I think that there's a lot more that needs to be iterated on and tested to see whether or not it works, but kind of being in this DAO space, like there are a lot of organizations that say that they're a DAO and they don't really run like one, um, especially if it's like a key man risk, right? Like if there's, if they're like, oh, we're a DAO. And then there's like three co two, three co-founders, one co-founder, and then they leave. It's like, oh shit, is it really a DAO anymore? Because <laughs> that one really important person just left. Now shit, like we're, we're, we're kind of screwed, right? Like, yeah, not pretty screwed. That, right? <laughs> um that's right that's that. right and man then, <laughs> and going back to the thing we were talking about like last time like the token thing is like a lot of people think that just dropping a token giving it to people and then saying oh if you own the token you're part of this DAO also doesn't work because just because you have a token doesn't mean at all that you're incentivized to want to make the best decisions for the overall organization and or if it even makes sense to have a token in the first place right um so a lot of complexity is involved in actually making a DAO truly a DAO um, and there are versions where it's like kind of intermediate, but at the end of the day, I think the biggest point to understand here is, does it actually make sense to go and make your company a DAO? Yeah. That's right. And that led me to the third question, which is what's the worst advice and most or misunderstood concept in blockchain web three? Uh, two things. 
Number one, adding Web3 and blockchain to your pitch deck just so you can raise more money. Uh, I've seen that. I've seen most... that a couple of times. It's so <laughs> right, annoying. Exactly. Yeah. Especially most of the people who are investors... actually working on Web3 native stuff. It's like, oh, dude, this is not Web3 at all. Right. <laughs> and I mean, thankfully now, most sophisticated investors have gotten to a point where they're like, okay, this is kind of bullshit. Like, I'm not going to give you money. But early in the cycle, when it was just like, you know, top of the bull market, people were just throwing money anywhere that said Web3, right? And so that was like one really big thing. Because also part of it is that, um, sure, as a founder, you think that your incentive is just, oh, I want to raise money. But part of the value here is also getting the right investors on your cap table to then say, hey, not only are they aligned to make sure that however they manage your equity is in the right way, but also they can actually provide you advice and help in the specific domain that you are in. And so if you're saying I'm in Web3 and you get a Web3 investor in cap table, but you're not, then like, what's the point of having that investor if it's just money, right? Um, right. So there's that. And then the second advice that I usually give people is don't launch your token uh, until you actually know that you need a token. Um, the, I think I had a tweet about this. It was like, there are three steps to launching a token or something like that. Um, step one is uh, create a community that's a really strong, tight-knit community. Number two, create a business model that actually works. And then number three, then launch a token after. Because most people do it well before both. They think that they can bootstrap a community with a token. They think that with a, with a community that they can create some semblance of a business model or revenue by launch token, but there's no business model. And neither of those cases work, right? Because you don't have the right things in place in order for that token model to be the right one. Um, and that it's just going to make it, make it a lot more difficult, if not just completely die, kill off your project um, yeah, if you dude. don't have a token that's set up in the right way. Yeah, yeah dude. You know, I, 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 can't, I can't count with my hand and my toes how many people <laughs> that I've encountered that thinks I am going to launch a token but never thought about a next step. Right? They don't right. think about the next thing. They say, hey, you know what? We'll figure out when we get there. But I don't think that works, right? Would you agree, Evan? Yeah. Like, it doesn't work. You just like, well, we're going to get there and then and then we're going to figure it out. You know, I, I don't really think that works that way. So that's that's why I did a tremendous amount of research, including, yeah. you know, consulting advice from you um, and eventually deciding that, hey, launching a token is not what we want to do at 10 exit, right? But, you know, I've seen many, many people who did it and they were like, okay, we're just going to figure out later. But hey, Evan, right. thank you so much, man. I really appreciate you jumping on the show. It's such a, a blessing to have you on Above the JPEG, honestly, because now we're going to share all this great knowledge to everybody who's listening to it. So Evan, thank you so much for being on our show, brother.